Hello learners, welcome to NIOS. Today we are going to discuss about absorption, transport and water loss in plants part 2. In our previous session, we have gone through with the water loss and absorption. But how the water loss occurs in plants? That already we have discussed a little bit like transpiration, exudation and guttation. So here in this session, we will discuss about transpiration and also transportation of materials in plants. Transpiration is the giving of water vapor from the surface of a plant or the loss of water from the living tissue of aerial parts of the plant in the form of water vapor that is called as transpiration. Three types of transpiration we have come across. One is cuticular transpiration, second one is lenticular transpiration and third one is stomatal transpiration. Cuticular transpiration occurs through the cuticle. Cuticle is the thick layer over the leaf surface. This thicker cuticle less more the thicker cuticle less will be the rate of transpiration. Lenticular transpiration is a type of transpiration which occurs through the lenticels. Lenticels are small regions on the bark and this bear loosely arranged cells. Negligible amount of water is lost through lenticular transpiration. So cuticular transpiration and lenticular transpiration in comparison with the stomatal transpiration loses less water. Now come to stomatal transpiration. This is a more than 95% of total loss of water occurs through stomatal transpiration. This takes place through stomata and it is considered to be the most important type of transpiration because transpiration also plays important role in plants life as well as in atmospheric life. Now what is that stomata? Stomata is an apparatus. It helps in gaseous exchange at the time of respiration and photosynthesis. The stoma acts as a targer operated bulb which closes and opens according to alternate change in the flaccidity and the turgidity of GERD cell and subsidiary cells. Opening and closing of stomata occurs due to target changes in guard cells due to endosmosis. An increase in target of guard cell takes place which finally results in stretching and bulging out of their outer thin walls. This results in opening of stomata. In a nutshell, more the water absorption more will be the stretching of guard cells and more will be the opening of stomata. When the target pressure of the guard cell decreases, inner walls sag leading to the closure of space that is the stomatal space. Hence the stomata closes. Here the illustration which will tell you how stomata looks like in dicotyledonous leaf and also in monocotyledonous leaf. In dicot, the stomata is kidney shaped or you can say the guard cells are kidney shaped stomatal opening is regulated by guard cells and in monocotyledonous leaf, the guard cells are dumbbell shaped. Now come to starch sugar hypothesis. What the hypothesis says? The hypothesis said that during day, starch of the guard cells is converted into sugar because by the process of photosynthesis plants prepare their food and food is starch and this food starch food is nothing but C6H12O6 which is sugar. It increases the osmotic contents of guard cells which leads to endosmosis and finally opens the stomata. Why it happens? Because more the osmotic content it will lead to maximum endosmosis and finally opens the stomata. But during the night time, however, sugar is converted back to starch and thus by exosmosis that is giving out of water from the cell to the outside. 
and this is called as exosmosis. So by the process of exosmosis, it loses water and thus it close, close stomata gets closed. So how the stomata opens during day, in light different types of reaction actually occurs. Photosynthesis occurs during daytime and CO2 is the basic component of the process of photosynthesis. In sunlight, CO2 is consumed by the mesophyll cells and which in turn increases the pH or you can say the hydrogen ion concentration resulting in the reduction in acidity. In return, it hydrolyzes starch into sugar which results in the osmotic concentration which increases and endosmosis occurs in card cells. Thus, stomata opens. In contrast to that, how the reaction takes place in dark? CO2 accumulates in the guard cells in absence of photosynthesis because during daytime photosynthesis occurs, but in nighttime no photosynthesis takes place. In return, pH gets reduced and acidity increases. Thus, sugar converts into starch. In return, exosmosis of water takes place from the guard cells and thus Tulgar pressure decreases leading to the closing of stomata. Here is an illustration which says the role of ions in opening of stomata because now I am going to discuss about the roles of some of the ions which are very much essential during the closing and opening of stomata. Thus in this illustration you can see potassium ion and chlorine ion and also the malate ion lowers the water potential and hence the endosmosis takes place. Here it comes how potassium ion actually help in stomatal opening during the daylight. Influx of potassium ions takes place in guard cells which increase the solute concentration and endosmosis of water. Because of the endosmosis of water, turgidity of this increases and stomatal pore opens up. But during night time, potassium ions get lost by the guard cells and solute concentration decreases. In return, opposite to endosmosis, exosmosis takes place and turgidity decreases. Thus, the stomata closes. So why this potassium ion is required? Potassium ion Chloride ion and the malate ion actually help in the increase and decrease of the water potential inside the cell. Now how to balance this potassium ion uptake? This uptake of potassium ion is balanced by one of the following, uptake of chloride ion, the subsidiary cells lack chloroplasts and take up chloride ions as anions to balance the influx of potassium ions. And transport of hydrogen ions which are very much necessary for the increase and decrease of pH concentration and also acidity, right? So transport of hydrogen ions release from the organic acids. The organic acid dissociates into malate and hydrogen ion. Potassium reacts with malate to form potassium malate which increases the solute concentration and also by negative changes of organic acids such as malic acid. Now how the, there is an, uh, there are some uh, hormones we have gone through, abscisic acid is one of them. So abscisic acid is also called as growth inhibitor but here also it is also inhibitor, it acts as inhibitor how you see ABA blocks the active excretion of hydrogen ion from guard cells. Due to the presence of CO2, a rapid acidification of cytoplasm occurs and thus leading to stomatal closure, thus preventing excessive water loss. Excessive water loss must be maintained and must be balanced and thus ABA help in that under experimental conditions also. When abscisic acid is applied to the leaves, stomata gets closed and check water loss. 
stomatal movement gets affected by certain factors. These factors are increased solute concentration of the gut cells which allow endosmosis of water into the gut cells making them turgid. Already you have gone through how endosmosis make the cells turgid. Here also stomatal pore opens because of the turgidity of the gut cells and this turgidity happens because of the increased solute concentration which in turn result into endosmosis of water. Light another factor which causes photosynthesis in gut cells because without light photosynthesis is not possible and by the chloroplasts accumulation of sugar takes place in gut cells and it, it would increase concentration of solutes in gut cells. Entry of potassium ions from subsidiary cells into gut cells would further increase solute concentration in gut cells. So these all are related to the concentration of solute and solution in return. Now come to the most important point like transpiration because transpiration plays important role in mineral salts absorption, absorption of water and also the cooling, cooling uh, system. So transpiration occurs in two stage. First of all, the evaporation of water from the cell walls of mesophyll cells into the intercellular spaces of course. Next, the diffusion of the water vapor of the inner cellular spaces into the outside atmosphere through cuticles, lenticels and stomata that you have gone through. When the outside atmosphere is drier, then by the process of diffusion, it will pass on the water in the form of water vapor from the cells through cuticles, lenticels and the stomata. Some factors actually affect the process of transpiration. One is atmospheric humidity. You have gone through most probably and you must have noticed that during the humid day, the dry water also gets dry very late, right? So atmospheric humidity plays important role in the process of transpiration. In humid atmosphere, the rate of transpiration is reduced whereas in dry weather, the rate of transpiration increases. Wind also plays important role because during moderate wind velocity, the rate increases, rate means rate of transpiration increases and in high wind velocity, the process is reduced by the mechanical closure of stomata and by cooling effect. Next is atmospheric pressure. Lower the atmospheric pressure, increase of the rate of transpiration. Soil temperature also plays important role in transpiration process. The plants growing in warm regions show less transpiration. Air temperature during midday closure of stomata occurs and also water evaporates with enhanced rate. Water is another factor like less amount of soil water decreases the rate of transpiration because there is a root shoot ratio which we will study afterwards because more, more the water available to the root it will absorb more and more water and transpiration rate will be increased. If the rate of transpiration exceeds the rate of absorption the stomata closes and plant wilts. So two types of wilting is there one is incipient wilting the partial loss of turgidity which does not cause visible wilting is known as incipient wilting. And if the plants cannot regain their original state that is of permanent wilting. Light also plays important role like with increase in light intensity the rate of transpiration increases because stomata get opened and the temperature increases. There are certain internal factors which also affect that process of transpiration. One is leaf surface, reduce the surface of the leaf, the less will be the process of transpiration. 
more we can see in xerophytic plants. Leaf surface is reduced to spine. So, reduced leaf surface reduce the rate of transpiration as in some of the xerophytes, for example, Upantia. Next comes root shoot ratio. Just I was mentioning that rate of transpiration is directly proportional to the water absorbed by the roots and transpired by leaves. The increase in ratio of root and shoot enhances the rate of transpiration. Age of plants also again play important role in the process of transpiration because germinating seeds show a very slow rate of transpiration. It becomes maximum at maturity. However, it decreases at senescent stage. Now, transpiration basically it's uh, you can say it's a necessary evil, but there are certain advantages of transpiration also. Without transpiration, there will be no absorption of water by root hairs. And water is very much essential for the plants to survive, to uh, live their life long and also to carry out the process of photosynthesis. So, absorption of water is, uh, it controls the rate of absorption of water from the soil by the process of transpiration. Water movement by transpiration, water moves upwards and gives a form and shape to the cells and to the plants as a whole. The mineral salt transport, the water stream moving upwards carries the dissolved mineral required for the development of the plant because mineral salts only can get absorbed by the plants along with the water current. And this water absorption is again possible by the process of transpiration. More the water loss, more will be the absorption of water if it is available in the soil by the root hairs. The process of transpiration has got a wonderful cooling effect. It regulates the plant temperature and contribute to the cooling of leaves and surrounding air. Certain anti-transparents are also there. So what are these? Let us have a look. The high rate of transpiration causes wilting in the crop plants and results in poor yield, so which is not actually desirable. Here, certain chemicals can be used to reduce the rate of transpiration and are called as antitranspirants. Because why this antitranspirants are required in some of the cases, every time we cannot have a check how much transpiration is uh, happening and how much water is available by the plant root, uh, plant root hairs. So certain chemicals like PMA, phenyl mercuric acetate, and abscisic acid, which causes partial closure of stomata, checking transpiration to some extent. Some waxy substances also can act as antitranspirant, like silicon emulsion from a thin film over the leaf and over the stomata without affecting the uptake of CO2. Now, transpiration and photosynthesis. These are called as a compromise. Why? The process of photosynthesis needs water and transpiration reduce the supply of water. That is also for photosynthesis. For 1 gram of CO2 fixed during Calvin cycle, 300 to 400 grams of water is escaped during transpiration. Rainforests are humid mainly due to cycling of water from plants to atmosphere and again back to soil in the form of rain, etc. Now, transpiration makes the absorption possible in some way or the other, but how the translocation happens? Because once the photosynthesis is done by the plant leaves, food is prepared, the food must be transported or translocated to different parts of the plants. So, this translocation is of organic solutes. This movement of organic and inorganic solutes from one part of the plant to another is known as the translocation. For example, transport of sugar in sieve tubes of leaves to stem or fruit. Sugar is produced by the process of photosynthesis. 
and that happens in leaves and then sent to all parts of the plants. Leaf is known as the source and also is, we know leaf is also known as the kitchen of the plant where the food is produced and all other parts of the plant which receive the food is known as the sink. How the course of translocation takes place? The direction of transport in phloem varies during the developing stage of plant. Young seedlings move food upwards from seed to young leaves. Food migrates from leaves to roots and fruits in downward and also upward direction. Food migrates from the parts where it is plenty to those where it is required, that is sink. The course of translocation is already we have discussed three uh, uh, ways. One is downward translocation, next is upward translocation, another one is radial translocation. Downward translocation is, takes place from leaves to other parts and upward translocation takes place from storage that means the leaves to new buds and the developing fruits. Radial translocation, it translocates organic solutes within the stem that is cells of path to the cortex. Here is an illustration which actually will tell you about the munch hypothesis we will come across in uh, uh, next slide. So how this root cells absorb water from the soil and allow through xylem to the upper part of the plant and along with the water current all those minerals actually get transported through the leaves. In leaves the food gets prepared and food by the uh, phloem sieve tubes get transported to different parts of the plant. You can see in this illustration downward movement is also there and also by uh, in other cambium there is another arrow which is uh, denoting how the organic solutes are getting transported to the cambium also. Mechanism of translocation. Phloem carries a viscous fluid of metabolites mainly having sucrose. Free flow of viscous phloem sap is not affected by narrow sieve plates. Sugar solution in the phloem sieve tubes moves along the water potential gradient created between the source that is leaf and the sink storage cells. According to Munch's hypothesis, Munch actually, there is a scientist which, who actually put forward the theory which is uh, known as Munch's uh, mass flow hypothesis. This hypothesis says the food material is translocated through phloem along the concentration gradient between the sources of food material and from source to the site of utilization that is sink. Here the illustration says how sip tubes look like. Sip tubes actually are the main component of phloem. Phloem has got five component, phloem parenchyma, phloem fiber, sieve tubes and companion cells. So sieve plates actually play a very important role in the process of translocation of organic solutes. A decrease in sieve element target below a certain level would lead to compensatory increase in loading. High sugar concentration in the apoplast would increase phloem loading. One is decreasing, another one is increasing, you can uh, see to it. The levels of proteins have been shown to be lower after 15 hours of dark darkness than after light treatment. Numerous mitochondria in companion cells may supply energy as ATP to sieve elements. Now here is a question time. I have put forward a certain question which are actually based on the content which already we have discussed. I hope all of you will be able to do that. But if you have any query, you can come to us. Thank you.